grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. My friends, this morning's Mass is our multiple intention Mass. The names of our beloved faithful departed to be read in the prayers of the faithful. And today we celebrate Fourth of July weekend, an opportunity to celebrate, reflect our independence, the freedoms that we have in this nation, but also because of the words of our Lord, to what end do we live that freedom, both for ourselves, those around us, our whole society. So let us first acknowledge our sin in order to prepare ourselves for these sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts, in my words, in what I have done, in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask blessed Mary, the Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace to people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, Receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, who through the grace of adoption chose us to be children of light, grant, we pray, that we may not be wrapped in the darkness of error, but always be seen to stand in the bright light of truth. To our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. where there was a woman of influence who urged him to dine with her. Afterward, whenever he passed by, he used to stop there to dine. So she said to her husband, I know that Elisha is a holy man of God. Since he visits us often, let us arrange a little room on the roof and furnish it for him with a bed table, chair, and lamp, so that when he comes to us, he can stay there. Some time later, Elisha arrived and stayed in the room overnight. Later, Elisha asked, can something be done for her? His servant, Gehazi, answered, yes, she has no son and her husband is getting on in years. Elisha said, call her. When the woman had been called and stood at the door, Elisha promised, this time next year, you will be fondling a baby son. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God.
and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Whoever receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives only a cup of cold water to one of these little ones to drink because the little one is a disciple, amen, I say to you, he will surely not lose his reward. The Gospel of the Lord. One of the <clears throat> descriptions of the life of a priest that kind of makes me wince a little bit is saying that the beauty and fullness comes from being in the highs and lows, lows of the lives to whom we minister. I wince because it comes from a time we can hear the echoes of a society of faith, the joy of baptisms, the weddings, the first communions, but also the sadness of funerals, the difficult confessions and counseling, the somberness of last rites. A funeral in the morning, but a wedding in the evening, that's the grandeur of the priesthood. The pattern, of course, is still there, but with one stark difference. Most of the people at a funeral or a wedding are basically irreligious. That's why for me, those occasions with guests, if you will, when we invite people to the church, uh, always require a line of evangelization underneath. In between everything I say, I'm evangelizing. Only Christ makes sense of life. And I try to use the occasion, either the couple at the wedding or the departed at a funeral as the example. For a wedding, it's very joyful. It's particularly joyful when a young couple gets married in our parish and they're saying, Father, we're going to move here and we're going to raise our kids here and baptize them. First, we you're like, oh, new life, new family. My homily is very short, too, because nobody listens to what I'm saying at a wedding. They want to see the vows. They want to go to the, um, they want to go to the, uh, to the reception. But I do try to throw a couple of little humorous points in there and, and, and use the joy of the moment to try to reach out to those who need sacraments. People who haven't been married in church, maybe they never been confirmed, you know? Maybe they're not Catholic. So I say, you know, we have these great places for weddings where you won't sweat on the golf course, or have your feet burned on a beach, or your hair messed up on a mountaintop, and you'll hear the minister very clearly. We call them churches, and it's a great place to have your wedding. And the couple themselves become an example to everyone there that they are centering their life on God, that their new life begins with God as the bond, as opposed to chasing moments of fleeting meaning in passing earthly allurements, like a wedding on a mountaintop. Obviously, the tone is the exact opposite at the most tragic and sorrowful of funerals such as the death of a young person by a drug overdose or suicide. I'm still talking to young people, but now reaching through the pain and confusion because now they are listening. And I say in the theme underneath, though it's very explicit, centering your life in God is the only way to happiness in life rather than chasing meaning in moments of passing allurements in this world. It's the same message very different circumstance. For us, this is the core message of the Lord today. What directs your life and purpose? What drives you? What is your ultimate goal or the end purpose of your life? If anything in this world, particularly those passing allurements like wealth, power, pleasure, then you will not find fulfillment in this life and you could lose eternal life to boot. But what if this stark even in a sense contradictory statement of our Lord that what should be the good center then? If I don't put money first, but I love my family, why is that not enough? 
Well, I mean, when you think of it, like the fourth commandment says, honor thy mother and father. And the natural law, we are just given this, un you all have unconditional love for your children, of course. So first, let's dig into what the Lord is saying in the presence of what he's doing right today in the gospel. Notice here that the Lord is speaking above the norms of morality. Sometimes what he did, remember he said that the Son of Man is still uh, Lord of even the Sabbath? He's speaking of, he's not contradicting it, but what he's saying is, I am God. I am higher than the commandments. I am the ultimate goal of even how we live life. He's not contradicting, uh, but he is, if you will, prioritizing what? God above all things, your neighbor as yourself. That's the, the summit of the law. And God is above all things. Second, though, as we get into sort of our own kind of, how do I deal with this? We need to jettison ideas that Jesus is only soft and cuddly. He can be soft and cuddly, obviously. But he can also be very challenging. Third, and this is a little easier to process, he's speaking to the apostles. He's saying this directly to the apostles. Sometimes we think everything in the Bible is for us. Well, some things are and some things aren't. Right? He didn't give me the keys to the kingdom. He gave that to St. Peter. Right? So he's talking to the apostles about what they are headed for. And they did leave their wives and families for their missions. His disciples, his students, who will speak with his own authority and will imitate him even to death. For us, picking up our cross has a spiritual meaning and metaphor to it. For the apostles, it was their destiny. They were all to give their lives completely for Jesus Christ. This is why the Lord says, that you will receive a prophet's reward to the one who welcomes a prophet. This is what we saw in the first reading, right? The Shumanite woman receives the reward from uh, Elisha because he is consecrated to God. And so he gives everything up, but the Lord rewards those who care for them. Nevertheless, as with how picking up our cross has a more spiritual meaning for us, so does the part about not loving anything before God that has a spiritual meaning we take. First, our children may be called to give their life to Christ as a priest or religious sister or a brother, right? We can't, um, we should support that. Not, you know, I want grandchildren. Yeah, but maybe somebody could be, is called to be a priest. Also, and this is even more uh, direct, when our kids go astray, do we understand, and in our world, they go astray in the most dramatic ways that are contrary to the gospel. Do we know that I stay close to the gospel, or do I go astray with them? That's a very direct meaning of what the Lord is saying. Like, do I, do I facilitate the life that is contrary to the gospel? Do I, you can still love them, but do I say, no, I cannot accept that lifestyle that is not of Christ? It's a very difficult thing to do. Similarly, regarding the idea of trying to hold on to this life, this world, and lose it, our goal of a life of God does come with a twist. It does come with a, like, don't worry so much just yet. And this is the kicker. If we put God first, then life, family, society is enhanced, actually, by God, because He is our origin and end. We don't lose our life. We don't lose our family. It becomes better. Far from losing life, family, and society, the whole of life becomes focused on its origin and end, and is saved. I'm gonna give a few quotes, kind of to close out the homily, but one theologian speaking to this topic puts it very eloquently. In the last resort, becoming a believer always means the same thing. Another reality looms before the person formerly enclosed on their own world. Its truth, its goodness, its holiness become more de definite, and the demand and demands allegiance from the one who has been called. The sacrifice of one's own independence will be difficult because the soul must first lose itself by recognizing another goal, and that goal is the true goal of life. I just spoke of personal independence. This is Fourth of July weekend. Certainly where we focus on our nation's independence, our culture, our values, our liberty. And yet, kind of getting back to what we were talking about with the young people in tragedy,
How often do we scratch our heads uh, regarding the things that young people get into even lose their lives over? Haven't we been teaching tolerance and respecting others? Don't we constantly preach teaching? Don't we have helicopter parents, which I guess now the term is bulldozer parent? Yet we see harmful behavior and death somehow, meaning that young people are not learning the value, beauty, and fragileness of their own life, of God's gift of life. I'll give you perhaps an insight into this as we think of 4th of July. I commend to you a little Independence Day reading. It's raining anyway today, so you might as well look it up. George Washington's farewell address in 1796 after he left the presidency. It's very rich, very elevated, very insightful. You'll recognize some of the phrases in there like, beware of foreign entanglements, right? That's a famous line that we all know. It's a very broad address. But here's a quote that refers to the people, us, formed for self-governance. In other words, here's his insight on how we can have a good society if we are called to govern ourselves. Of all the dispositions and habits which led, the politi led to political prosperity, religion and morality are inseparable supports. His reasoning continues, but then he cuts to the chase. He goes to the bottom line. Let it simply be asked, where is the security for property, for reputation, for life, if the sense of religious obligation deserts the oaths that are taken in courts of justice? I promise to tell the truth. I promise not to steal. I sign a contract. If you don't have religion saying that's wrong, it's only going to be a couple generations where it all fades. And he anticipates the whole separation of church and state thing. He says, and let us with caution, in other words, let's be careful, not to indulge the supposition that morality can be nourished without religion, whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education. So you can come up with the best education system you think you have, but if you don't have moral education, resting on faith or religion or something, it's gonna go away. He continues, and he's not right, he's not trying to found a state religion. He's just saying, let's be careful. Culturally, it is substantially true that virtue or morality is a necessary spring of popular government, that is democracy. What he's basically saying is, you need a virtuous people for virtuous government in a democracy. Next quote, Archbishop Timothy Broglio, Archdiocese of Military Services, uh, and now he's actually the president of the uh, Bishops' Conference in the United States. A good Catholic is a good American because the practice of virtue also leads to good citizenship. And there is no dichotomy between faith and life if we cultivate, cultivate and practice virtue. The old Webster Dictionary refers or gives the definition of the word virtue. General moral goodness, right action and thinking, uprightness, rectitude, morality. So when George Washington says it takes a virtuous people to have a virtuous government, we're talking about moral virtue. But we can switch all this down into a super quote by uh, William Penn of Pennsylvania, where I believe our um, Bill of Rights actually is modeled after what they were doing there. He states, men must be governed by God or they will be ruled by tyrants. Continues. Do not be afraid to bring God into the public square. Far from threatening our nation's life, liberty, and prosperity, you will in fact be ensuring it.
For our sake, he was crucified by Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the judgment of the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, the proceeds of God and Son, who with the Father and the Son and the Lord and the Lord of God, who has spoken with the prophets. I believe in one holy God and the apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world of time. Amen. Confident that our Father desires to hear our prayers, we offer our prayers and petitions for the church, for the world, and our nation at this time. For the church, may the light of truth radiate in all her members to the glory of God and the salvation of many. And for our parishes, may we welcome those who follow the Lord and encourage one another in living our vocation to holiness. We praise the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. On this 4th of July weekend, we pray for our nation. May God preserve us in the liberty of many men and women of sacrifice to establish. And may we be vigilant in protecting the freedoms we enjoy. And for the protection of the form conception to natural death, the institution of marriage, and freedom of religion, we pray to the Lord. For all servicemen and women at home and abroad, we pray to the Lord. For those traveling during the summer holidays, they may be kept safe and return home renewed and refreshed. We pray to the Lord. For the poor, the unemployed, and those unable to care for their families, may they find help from the church and the peace of Christ in their difficulties. As always, we pray for those in our prayer corner, Book of Intentions, Hospice Care, and Assisted Living, we pray to the Lord. We pray for those who have died, such as Suzanne Daigle, whose funeral we recently offered, and especially for Arch Archangelo Drago, Chichi Okiki, Marie Michelle Deschardins, Saveur Gabriel, and Anna Suwaka, for whom this Mass is offered, may they be welcomed by the angels and saints, and may their loved ones be consoled. We pray to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty Father, we offer these and all the prayers that we hold the silence of our hearts, and all the prayers others have asked us to offer at this altar of sacrifice. We ask all these through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Pray, friends, that my sacrifice and yours may be accepted to God, the Almighty Father. O God, who graciously accomplished the effects of your mysteries, grant, we pray, that the deeds by which we serve you may be worthy of these sacred gifts. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Amen. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For in you we live and move and have our being, and while in this body we not only experience the daily effects of your care, but even now possess the pledge of life eternal. For having received the first fruits of the Spirit, to whom you raised up Jesus from the dead, we hope for an everlasting share in the Paschal mystery. So with all the angels we praise you, as in joyful celebration we acclaim. Amen.
especially the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Monica, St. Lucy, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for the failing God. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O oh Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis our Pope, Sean our Bishop, Robert our Auxiliary, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world, to our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you in their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, to whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
May this divine sacrifice we have offered and received fill us with life, O Lord, we pray, so that bound to you in lasting charity we may bear fruit that lasts forever. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. A couple of announcements. One, our new parochial vicar is here, Father Michael Harvey. Um, I'm trying to slowly uh, break him in and uh, but also teach him a thousand things about how we turn on lights and all that. So. Um, I'm going to be racing to do the 10.30 over there to get in time to kind of spin up in the noon. So I hope you all have a good 4th of July weekend. As a reminder, Eucharistic Adoration on Wednesday and Fridays is, you know, on pause until we kind of get our act together. Uh, so we may begin in August, we may begin earlier, but Adoration is on pause for the next couple of weeks, at least. Uh, registration for Faith Formation and Sacrament Preparation begins next Monday, July 10th. Visit the website to register or call the office. And once again, as a reminder, uh, because of the way the holiday works, it's an opportunity. Basically, the offices are closed for the week. They'll open up again on uh, July 10th. And uh, again, have a blessed 4th of July. And safe and healthy and happy one. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. St. Michael, we are angels, and thus is God. We are protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God be